Investors like to think of capital gains tax rates as the government telling investors to buy and hold. We'll reward you by giving you these beneficial tax rates. All right, so today we're going to talk about how different types of investment income are taxed. We're going to talk about interest, tax exempt income, dividends, and capital gains. So let's jump in. We'll start with interest income. According to the IRS, interest income comes from certain bank accounts or from lending money to someone else. Typically, you'll earn interest income on like a high yield savings account, right? What happens is you put your monies in the savings account. The bank then takes that money and lends it to someone else at an even higher interest rate. And then they pay you interest for letting them hold your money in savings. Interest income is normally taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. When interest and other types of investment income are taxed at the ordinary tax rate, it means this income doesn't get a special tax treatment. So taxable interest is added to your wages, retirement income, and other types of ordinary income to arrive at your taxable income. Your taxable income is then subject to the marginal tax rates that you see here. So for 2022, let's say your taxable income is 50,000. That means 10,275 of your income is taxed at around 10%. And then up to 41,775 is taxed at the 12% rate, and then the remainder is taxed at 22%. Normally, a bank or financial institution will provide you your taxable interest for the year on form 1099-INT. Sometimes it could come to you on a form 1099-OID. OID stands for Original Issue Discount, and that's if you've invested in bonds or some type of debt instrument. Now, sometimes interest is not taxable, and that brings us to our next type of investment income, tax-exempt income. Tax-exempt interest income can come from bonds issued at the state level, at the city level, from the District of Columbia. These kinds are known as municipal bonds. With municipal bonds, the interest might be tax-exempt at the federal level, but they could be taxed at the state level. Also, you could earn tax-exempt income from U.S. Treasury securities, now with these, you might be taxed at the federal level, but not at the state level. I gotta make sure I got that right. <laughs> yeah, so this is why you might need a tax preparer because you gotta know which level you're taxed at. Both of these types of tax exempt income are also reported to you on form 1099 INT. Next up, let's talk about dividends. Dividends are a distribution of a company's earnings to its shareholders. How a dividend is taxed depends on whether the dividend is qualified or non-qualified. Qualified dividends have to meet certain requirements. According to the IRS tax code, a qualified dividend has to come from a qualified domestic corporation or a qualified foreign corporation. Lots of using the term qualified, right? <laughs> We're not going to dive into what types of domestic corporations are considered qualified and what types of Foreign corporations are considered qualified. I'm leaving the tax code there. You can look it up or you can Google. You know how it goes. So to have a qualified dividend, not only do the shares have to come from a certain type of corporation, but you also have to meet a holding period requirement. That holding period depends on whether you own the shares directly through a company or whether you own them through a mutual fund. But in general, you want to own the shares at least 61 days or more out of a 121 day period that began 60 days before the securities ex dividend rate. Now that's a lot, right? And, and not only that, if you own preferred shares, you have to hold the shares even longer for them to qualify as qualified dividends. Having said all that, it's confusing, right? Don't worry about it unless you want to calculate it yourself. But usually whatever financial institution you're trading with, They'll provide you that information at the end of the tax year on a form called 1099-DIV, and that'll tell you which dividends are qualified and which are non-qualified. All right, so if you meet all of those requirements, then your dividend could be subject to something called a capital gains tax rate. Now this is the good stuff. So as you can see on this capital gains tax rate table, if your income is at a certain level, the capital gains tax rate can be very beneficial. For example, if your income is below $40,000, then a qualified dividend that you receive could be subject to 0% federal tax. 
and that's pretty cool. Investors like to think of capital gains tax rates as the government telling investors to buy and hold. We'll reward you by giving you these beneficial tax rates. Okay, so if your dividend does not meet the holding period requirements that we previously discussed, or the eligibility requirements that we previously discussed, then it's considered a non-qualified dividend. Now, keep in mind, if you invest with a real estate investment trust, also known as a REIT, a mastered limited partnership, or any other corporation that doesn't meet the typical corporation structure, then those dividends cannot be qualified dividends. They're gonna be non-qualified. Non-qualified dividends are just taxed at the ordinary income tax rate, just like those interest income amounts we discussed earlier, okay? Many passive investors automatically reinvest their cash dividends. When you reinvest your dividends, any dividend earned is used to purchase additional shares of the same stock. Know that you are taxed on dividend income in the year it is earned. Whether you reinvested your dividends or received your dividends as cash, know that you will be taxed on the dividend either way. That's enough talk about dividends. Now let's get into the good stuff, capital gains. What's a capital gain? Well, let's talk about it like this. Let's say you buy a share of a stock for $10, then you go on and sell it for $30, you have a capital gain of $20. How you're taxed on capital gains depends on how long you held the investment. Generally, if you hold an investment for more than a year, you're taxed at the capital gains tax rates. And we talked about those, right, when we talked about qualified dividends. They're sometimes more favorable tax rates. If you hold the investment for less than one year, then you're taxed at the short-term tax rate, which is just your ordinary tax rate, similar to the interest income we talked about, we talked about <laughs> and the non-qualified dividend income we talked about. Once again, it's like the government is incentivizing investors with tax to buy and hold. And capital gain income is normally reported to you on Form 1099-B. One other thing to mention is that if you have a capital loss, meaning you sold your investment for less than what you paid for it, you can use up to $3,000 of that loss to offset your ordinary income. If your loss was more than $3,000, you can take the difference and apply up to $3,000 to the next year. And then take $3,000 and apply it to the next tax year. And on and on and on, you get it indefinitely. That's how the law works in 2022 and in years prior. We'll see how it changes moving forward because y'all know these tax laws be changing and changing all the time. It's also important to know that your financial institution can identify which stocks to sell to provide you with the most favorable tax situation. They keep your shares in something called tax lots and they can use a method called FIFO or LIFO or specific identification to determine which to sell to provide the best taxable outcome. Uh, for instance, let's say you bought some shares of stock last year for $100 and then you bought another share yesterday for $300 and then today you want to sell the stock. Well, they can decide whether to sell the stock you bought last year, which had a basis of 100 or the stock you bought yesterday for 300 depending on which tax outcome you want. So make sure you discuss that with your financial advisor if you're being really intentional about your capital gain strategy. Now, let's discuss a few tax items that apply to each of these investment income types. First, foreign investment income is subject to the foreign country's tax. How that tax is paid depends on the country and some other factors, although often the financial institution will pay the tax on your behalf. The U.S. tax code does offer a tax credit for foreign tax paid on certain foreign investment income. We won't go over that here, but it's important to know. Second, taxpayers who meet a certain income threshold are subject to an additional tax on investment income. That's right, some taxpayers have to pay an additional 3.8% net investment income tax on top of ordinary capital gains and foreign tax. For more information, see the video below. Finally, investment income is subject to estimated tax provisions. If you earn significant investment income in a taxable account, you'll want to familiarize yourself with the estimated tax rules or make sure your tax preparer is in the know. Okay, so that's a brief summary of how those four types of investment income are taxed. Keep in mind, what we just discussed applies to investment income earned through personal taxable accounts. It does not apply to investments made through a trust or an LLC or other type of entity. Another disclaimer, day traders are subject to different tax laws on investment income. 
If you're a day trader, I'd recommend walking through IRS Topic 429 with your tax preparer. What I talked about also doesn't apply to tax advantaged accounts like Roth IRAs or 529 savings plans. We should probably do another video to talk about those accounts, right? But we're only talking about personal taxable accounts today. I hope this was helpful. This is the little CPA, not your little CPA. So make sure to reach out to your own investment advisor, financial advisor, accountant, and lawyer for specific advice. This is just for informational purposes, but I really appreciate you watching. Have a great day.